experience of the original two parents, its propulsive shaping of the ego identity, its elementary transformation symbolism, its miraculous transcendent function, an ideational revolution of perspective in considering basic Jungian notions about human psychological growth. Thus, for example, an expressively emergent homosexual eros in a man would functionally conflict the masculine double as determining soul figure and the feminine anima as romantically congruent ally, <clears throat> while a comparably forming heterosexual eros would likewise unfold the thematic object relational reverse. Earlier Jungian views had merely naturally assumed a heterosexual perspective on the part of organizing eros, the inherent intelligence of genitally directed love. Now with such novel, respectfully transgressive notions as I have just mentioned, gay liberation thinking accordingly arrived at the inner sanctum of rigorous analytic thought, the theory of the libido and its constructive transformations. I call this imagined figure of the homosexual libido's originative developmental intent, Uranian Eros, after Plato and Oryx, and then systematically followed out from there, various apposite metaphorical associations to suggestively show his improved mental alchemical operations in the ongoing incorporative enactment of a Uranian sacred marriage, or conjunctio with the responsive ego personality elevatingly up a transmuting divine ladder of the elemental sacred heart in refining qualitative development of value gate personhood through a cyclic propulsive haunting by a homosexually entrancing wraith buddy soul, consequently leading constructively through both improved differentiation and enhanced integration of conscious and unconscious psychological being from the original auspicious birth of rousing homosexual romance to an indescribably transcendent goal, the ultimate ethical purpose of maturational human existence. <clears throat> In my dissertation research, I had compared the contemporary experience of successfully reaching a secure view identity with Jung's expository treatment of a series of arcane pictures from an ancient European alchemical treatise called Rose Garden of the Philosophers, which show the passionate union and subsequent transformation of the alchemical king and queen to Jung, the growthful encounter between ego and unconscious. I, in turn, then investigatively interpreted these allegorical figures as analogously showing a receptive proto-ego faithfully encountering its authentic homosexual unconscious, yet the resulting analysis did not leave me entirely feeling entirely satisfied. I wondered why I had told the story of homosexual development through a patently heterosexual imagery. Also, that story had thematically focused on protein libidos advancing vicissitudes from puberty on, without addressing the formative kind of childhood dynamic which would account for the later configurative rise of gay adolescent sexuality and romance. The more I pondered this puzzle, the further I found that a thickly obscuring fogging had come over me, such that I was forced to patiently engage and sensitively relating actively to this thickly stubborn resistance for quite some time. But after many months of such actively efforted inner cooking, a crucially loaded association finally popped up. I suddenly saw an image in my mind that glowed intensely with an intangible light of all colors, an oddly fluorescent picture of my father as a young married man standing in front of my first home looking at the camera. That I had somehow been that had somehow been recalled from an old black and white snapshot I had once seen long ago. And it dawned on me just how out of it I had been about this problem. That actually here I was thematically confronting a homosexual sort of filthy mystery of the especially discreet sort, which Jung was always associating with heterosexual, erotic love, and the soul complex, genital incest, and the family romance. Now things quickly fell into a more understandable place. A basic wish for father-son incest swept up gay boys phallically in a shaping equivalent to that illicit desire conformingly molding the heterosexual helical complex, compelled thuswise oriently by Uranian Eros as the ruling divinity from the very beginning, thereby inevitably leading to an ambivalent identification with mother and the entire unfolding of a defining personal configuration necessarily metaphorically involving both originative parents of one's existently incarnated being, 
a homosexual familial romance, by which a responsive proto-ego and effective working tandem with a likewise emergent homosexual soul and his lusty angers pursued into serious adult love could be well organizationally constellated to therewith formatively actualize an androgynously integrated personhood. With this bright idea of a homosexual filthy mystery, something not at all ideationally heard before, radical gay liberation had coherently reached even that arcane secret mysterium, theoretically resident within the Jungian sanctum. I came to formulationally call this gay domestic motoric configuration the Uranian complex, just as I, I had similarly characterized the subsequent adult unfolding of worthy romantic interest as based on and occurring through the symbolic patterning dynamic of an alchemical Uranian conjunction. Now I could return to the already worked analysis in my doctoral dissertation and expensively fold in this underlying formative theme of homosexual libidos and lunatic and corporate of childhood to portray a more complete mythical story of humanely personalizing Uranian arrows successfully operational and constructive gay individuation thereby uncovering the widely incestuous secret of those transubstantiating efforts by which he cleverly achieves a full gay selfhood, and likewise by which he can be fully homosexually well-known psychically. With this advanced ideational clarification of a divinely royal mysterium, constituently present alchemically in the constitutionally formative encounter with commanding gay moments, I felt I had truly and honorably redeem the shameful, filthy secret of my own pubescent sexual awakening. I had indeed comprehensionally discovered a starting metaphorical lead that resultantly became preciously meaningful gold. This revised investigative study was then assembled with several of my Jungian papers in a newly written introduction into a book manuscript in 1996 called The Iranian Soul. Meanwhile, Trier's activism had been continuing into the 1990s on the part of various engaged participants in addition to myself, people such as Chris Kilbarn, who had become my partner in working towards better homosexual self-awareness starting in 1979. Mark Thompson, who was an editor at The Advocate when I recruited him into the original Radical Ferry Organizing Circle, probably around 1980, and who later became himself an important leader in the community as well as Doug Sedanin, currently director of the LGBT specialization in clinical psychology at Antioch University of Los Angeles, and Roger Kaufman, author, therapist, and educator, who both joined in the early 90s. Then, starting in 1996, in a developing situation that eventually mushroomed into a firestorm of reaction, an associate of various true activities began openly accusing Mark of likely infecting him with HIV at irresponsibly operated educational gatherings, a charge that Mark vigorously objected to. <clears throat> at first, I gave little credence to the possible accuracy of such accusations. Then, the more I considered the situation, the more other people began approaching me, spontaneously and unbidden, to mention other events, and also the ones under dispute which they had witnessed or reliably had heard about, where Mark had indeed appeared to behave in unsavory and distracted ways, with the result that what had at first seemed more clear to me now became much less so. When I then attempted to address this problem in a final face-to-face -face meeting with Mark, he vociferously again completely denied the validity of any negative comments about his behavior with an aroused tone that seemed to me noticeably quite defensive and even frightened after I pointed out that he appeared to be reacting psychologically in a very big way, and then inquiring into what was going on for him, our subsequent exchange quickly devolved into Mark basically dissociatively fleeing the room mentally in the forceful confrontational face of my insistent focus on thoroughly addressing the matter. And we finally parted with no resolution other than Mark conciliatingly agreeing with me in a seemingly half-dazed manner that he needed to face something in himself better. Since then, Mark has completely separated himself from anything related to myself or tree roots, even going so far as to recently say, according to someone who was present, 
that when we had known each other, I have been a mere acquaintance. <laughs> in fact, it is interesting to further note that after each important organizing figure, Mary, Don, and then Mark, dissociated from an authentic psychological attitude, each later reached a rapprochement with the others, <laughs> as shown, for example, in Mark leading workshops offered by Don's group, the Gay Men's Methods Circle, a while back, and also in Don frequently reminding people, as in his more recent Frontiers article on the Radical Furries of 30, that it was principally he and Harry who founded the Radical Furry movement. The confrontational situation with Mark Thompson wound up outlining for me all over again the steep challenge and remarkable power of seriously taking up a homosexual psychological attitude in how Mark, as had Don and Harry before him, in the end appeared to defend his defenses to the death, as they say, rather than fairly accept accurate responsibility for them. While I was willing in each case both to acknowledge my own feelings and actions in light of my private psychology, and to broadly recognize everyone's individual right to privacy, I was not willing with any of these persons, or with anyone if I can help it, to just as Mark put it in his final note to me, quote, agree to disagree, unquote, about giving carte blanche to violently act out on other people, one's private psychodynamic issues including the collusional forcing of others to submissively agree with such defensive forms of malicious acting out instead of vigorously exposing and openly dealing with those predatory dynamics all the way to their causal roots. The fierce hypocritical behavior of these three leaders is reactionarily typical of the psychologically uninitiated when faced with gravely embarrassing exposure. And I see similarly juvenile sorts of petulant ultimatums and other such dramatic maneuvers commonly in my psychotherapeutic practice. At the same time, these activist, dour, regressive consistency suggests the specific psychic ravages of profound homophobic bigotry as well as the onerous task of functionally breaking from the one-sided extrovert bias of socially trained externalizing. A protectionist vocational prejudice seemingly more doggedly stifling in society today than ever. I myself originally likewise existed arrestedly in the terrible psychic grip of such suffocatingly traumatic and regressive forces, and similarly, I have many times seen in my almost 40 years of doing counseling and therapy how it is quite possible for somebody to victoriously break that multifaceted defensive grip homosexually through the most challenging and profound of measured self-initiations systematically wrought by sincere and persistent inner psychological work. Therefore, in regard to a minimal level of sound capacity for psychological self-awareness and ethical responsibility absolutely necessary historically at this more advanced level of emancipatory subjective challenge, adequately functional leadership for the next stage of gay liberation theory and practice obviously requires a much more serious training in homosexual psychological authenticity and the contextual literacy required for this new capacity, such that it would inevitably be the case that an appropriate institution accordingly should be set up responsibly for this pioneering invocational purpose, conceptually underpinned functionally by an appropriate ideological formulation. This latter step began to more particularly concretize for me, first with an initial circumferential statement in 1999 called The Revolutionary Psychology of Gay-Centeredness in Men, three short essays. And then more comprehensively, starting in late 2002, with the death in October of Harold Hay. I noticeably felt in my imagination that an ethereal call had been sent out by his passing to augmentationally imbue my 1996 book manuscript with a deeper stylistic voice of newly synthesizing scope evocationally very far beyond that normally to be otherwise literarily expected, 
such that by the time I was well underway in the stylistic memorial endeavor of eventually four years, I could see that its growing cohesive thrust, formulative detail, and fade sensibility nicely set the descriptive stage comprehensionally, not only for my own current efforts as a gay activist practitioner and a person, but that of an increasing number of well-committed and tested fellow participants. 